So I recently built an app that attempts to improve the searchability of fly.io's documentation using AI. Now, was I successful? I don't know. You'll have to tell me when I show you this and, and how everything works behind the scenes. So let me start by showing you the app. So uh, here we go. This is a, a pretty familiar LLM chat experience. So I can ask it any question like, uh, does Fly have managed Postgres? It does take a little while to spit out an answer, and this is for a reason, which I'm going to get to in a second. All right, so it says, yes, Fly offers both a self-managed Postgres option and a fully managed Postgres uh, service that's currently in technical preview, which is true. And who knows, maybe when you're watching this, things will have changed. I can ask follow-up questions like, what other kinds of data stores are commonly used on Fly? Awesome. Okay, so it talks about Fly Postgres, LightFS for SQLite, Fly Volumes, uh, other external services, blah, blah, blah. Pretty cool. So what's really neat is that the model I'm using is actually being supplemented with the Fly.io documentation. So in theory, it should always have the most up-to-date information. The way I'm able to do this is through a process called retrieval augmented generation. Some of you may have heard of it. It's also called RAG. And that is sort of the crux of what I'll be walking you through today. Very briefly, let's assume you have a giant legal contract or an employee handbook, and you want to be able to query and ask questions about it. Well, a typical LLM will not have been trained on that data, obviously. And so RAG is a technique that allows you to augment that model with your own data without having to fine tune or retrain it. So let's dive into the code and I'll show you how all of this is set up. Okay, so what I have here is a simple app that uses React on the front end and then Python in the back end, just a very simple web server. Now, in order for us to be able to search the documentation, it needs to we need to do a little bit of setup. And there are four steps involved here. First, we need to clean up our data. Then we need to break it into small chunks. Then we need to convert those chunks into embeddings. And finally, we need to store those embeddings in a vector database. Now, I'll go through all of this in more detail. So let's start with step one. So cleaning up your data really is going to be specific to whatever information you're working with. So in, in my case, I'm working with markdown files. You might have Excel spreadsheets, you might have JSON objects, you might have PDFs, whatever it is, you need to make sure that you can access it in a way that you can easily break it into chunks. Now, this isn't just about standardizing things. This is also about maybe removing irrelevant information that would just clutter up the database. So for example, this is uh, one of the original markdown files that uh, is part of the fly documentation. What you see here is just a snapshot of our docs. And so here we've got one called getting started with fly GPUs. As you can see, it's got all this front matter. And really the only thing that I would care about as a user is the title itself. But like the layout, the nav, users don't care about that stuff. So I wrote a script that would basically strip out all of the front matter except for the title, because I'm gonna use that later. And so we can see then if we compare this to the original document, that gets converted into something like this, where it only has the title. Okay, so we've got our markdown all cleaned up. Now I need to break this into small chunks. And this is what's going to be searched whenever we write in a prompt. We're gonna say, hey, which of these chunks are related to my question? Here's the thing, this might sound simple, but it is not. In fact, I would say this is the step that gave me the most grief out of everything. I probably spent like 80% of my time on just this step. Now, my first attempt was rather naive. I just decided to break down the markdown files by sentence, but that proved to be pretty useless because without the context, you don't know what those sentences are about. So clearly these sentences needed more context. So I said, why not break the markdown files down by paragraph? And that was better, but still it didn't provide enough context. For one thing, a paragraph might be a single sentence. So it still wasn't enough. So at that point I was like, screw it. Let's go crazy. Let's make every single markdown file its own chunk. I wish it were that simple, but it is not. In reality, there are limits to how big these chunks can be. They can only be so many tokens and tokens are really just like numbers that represent words. So using the whole file didn't work. So this is what I landed on. I broke up the markdown files by H2 tag. And so a full chunk would consist of this. It would have the title of the article, the H2 tag, and then whatever was under 
that H2 tag. And that proved to be pretty useful. All right, then we move on to step three, which is to create embeddings from these chunks. Now, what what's an embedding, Annie? Let me give you an analogy. So let's say you have a memory of you and your dog playing in the snow. And that memory lives at some XYZ coordinates in your brain. That's not how brains work, but we're just gonna pretend. You also have a memory of you and your dog curled up by the fireplace, maybe drinking hot cocoa, hopefully not your dog. And that memory lives at its own XYZ coordinates, theoretically close to the memory of you and your dog in the snow, right? Those coordinates are close together. This is effectively what embeddings are. They are coordinates for specific pieces of information. Now, here's the thing. Humans, we can only visualize up to three dimensions. Anything beyond that and it's just, it just does not compute. But mathematically speaking, it's entirely possible to have any number of dimensions, all right? And it's very common for embeddings to have hundreds, if not thousands of dimensions. By converting information into embeddings, this is what allows us to easily see which pieces of information are related. Now you might be wondering, okay, Annie, but how do I, how do I know how to convert my text into embeddings? Well, this part is actually very easy because there are specific models designed for making embeddings. So here you can see in my code, I am using the OpenAI Text Embedding ADA002. This is a very common uh, embedding to use. Then here you can see I am creating a, uh, an embedding chunk with some extra metadata, like the content, the file name, etc. And then I'm saving this as uh, a JSON file. Now I did mention that we need to save these embeddings. This is not what I'm talking about. This is just a quality of life thing that uh, I, I highly recommend you do if you're building a RAG app. Um, if you run into an error after you've created these embeddings, then uh, guess what? You, now you have to recreate all of those embeddings and this can take a long time. So I uh, highly recommend you save your embeddings after you create them. The last thing we need to do is store our embeddings in a vector database, all right? <clears throat> now, vector databases have these things called indexes. And uh, these are effectively what you call a single vector database, all right, it's called an index. And these indexes have records, effectively rows. And this is what contains the embedding information, right? Every row is a new embedding. Here I am using a uh, pinecone. This is a hosted uh, vector database. I found it really easy to work with just because they have, they have a really nice dashboard. I decided to create a new index every time I was doing a new setup. Um, that's quite lengthy. I don't think you have to do it this way. This was just easier to do in development. And then here you can see I'm doing this in chunks of 100. And as you can see, I'm including a bit of metadata, including the content, of the embedding and the file name. And uh, the reason I did this is that it makes it easier to tell how the application came to the answer that it did. As you probably know, LLMs are kind of black boxes. We really don't have a way of explaining how it got to the answer that it did. But when you're using RAG, it's a lot easier to point to I got this information from that embedding and that embedding and that embedding. So it's a lot more easy to explain how it came to a certain conclusion. And that is it. This is how I set up my RAG application. And really this is just a, a one-time thing, um, or maybe it just needs to be run every time that the data is updated. Now, how does this application actually work when somebody sends in a prompt? So let's take a look at our web server. Uh, so here, let's go down here. I've got this API prompt endpoint. So when you submit a prompt, it hits this endpoint. And uh, here we do a number of things. First, we have to convert that query into its own embedding, all right? Now it's really important that we use the same model that we did before, because otherwise we're comparing apples to oranges. Then I'm taking that embedding and searching through my uh, vector database to see which embeddings are related to it. And here I've just set, like, just give me the top 10 results, which I could probably lower that to be honest. And then I'm passing all of this down, including the conversation history to this generate answer function. So if we take a look at this, you can see I've, I'm doing a little bit of prompt engineering. So I do think it's possible just to concatenate your prompt with the, the context that it found from the database and then just ship that off to an LLM. But I, I think there's a way of yielding better results. And that's through setting it up with a little bit more prompt engineering. So here you can see the full prompt that I'm sending. And then here I am just sending that off to some LLM to 
you know, do its thing. Why am I using anthropic models for one thing and then open AI for another? I don't, I have, there's no rhyme or reason. Now I have not decided to make this application live just yet. Uh, it's, I'm sort of on the fence. This is a bit of an experiment and I'm not confident that it will always give the best answers. I'll give you an example. So like, uh, one thing we don't support is, uh, daemon sets, daemon sets, daemon sets. I don't know how you say it, uh, with our managed Kubernetes service. And so if I were to ask, like, can I use daemon sets with FKS? Let's see how it does. Okay. So it says based on the documentation provided, there's no explicit mention of daemon sets in the fly Kubernetes service. Right. But if, the, if I were to rephrase my question, can I use daemon sets with fly Kubernetes or let's see if it's, if it answers this correctly. Okay. So it says, according to the documentation, daemon sets are explicitly not supported in fly Kubernetes. Uh, it says it's uh, under this features. We don't support section. And that is correct. So as you can see, depending on how I'm phrasing things, I might get a different answer. And that's because the database isn't always perfect at knowing, you know, different acronyms. If we have like custom terms, or if we have terms that we have, that we have multiple names for that can get really confusing. So this is not perfect. And I, I don't want to put it out there uh, and shoot somebody in the foot by giving them the wrong information. I mean, everyone knows that LLMs make things up, right? Like they hallucinate, but uh, I still want to be a little more certain. And, you know, maybe I'll just put some disclaimers on here and just say like, mm, this might lie to you. But anyways, what were my takeaways from doing this? Well, number one, chunking is very difficult. Uh, getting this right really was the most difficult part of all of this. And there are lots of different chunking strategies. You could do things by by paragraph, by sentence, uh, fixed length, sliding window. There's all sorts that uh, you can use. And it really just depends on what your data looks like. But overall, I think RAG is an incredibly useful technique. Okay. It's super super convenient and you don't have to fuss with retraining a model. Now, it is rather slow, all right? Because you're adding this extra step where you're, you're searching the database for relevant information. So it's always going to be slower than having a fully trained model. But what you give up in performance, you make up for in accuracy. And that's sort of the appeal of RAG. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video or if you didn't, let me know in the comment section below if you'd like to see more of these software show and tell uh, videos. I'd, I'd love to do more of them. It's nice actually getting to build stuff now and then. But with that being said, thank you all so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.